And a good Sunday morning to you. Dwight Davis with you. Welcome to our bird notes for today. A rose-breasted grosbeak, by any other name, would still sing as sweet. And this bird does have other names. Potato bug bird, common grosbeak, and summer grosbeak. All refer to the bird we know now as the rose-breasted grosbeak. All birds have a common name, in quotes, common name, given by consensus as representative of the bird. But most birds seem to have a variety of other names, of vernacular names, which can sometimes cause considerable confusion. Ornithologist John Terrace says that the flicker has at least 132 other names. He states that there are 21 other names for the old squaw, 70 for the ruddy duck. Adding to the confusion, in English anyway, are the British and American names for certain birds. The European sparrowhawk is an exhibitor. Our sparrowhawk, now called a kestrel, is a falcon. In England, a buzzard is a bootio hawk. Here the word buzzard is used for vultures, and so it goes. Audubon helped muddle things a bit too when he had... Uh, when he was discovering birds, but he had an excuse in that some of the birds were still unknown when he named them. Some of the birds he identified cannot be confirmed. Washington's eagle, for example, we believe today that he gave this name to an immature bald eagle, which he thought was a different species. Birds' names change for scientific reasons, good valid scientific reasons, too. Look in Frank Chaplin, Chapman's book, The Warblers of America, published in 1907, and you'll find references to the Senate's warbler, since considered a subspecies of the Perilla warbler. This uh, onomastic confusion came to mind recently when I was reading Jules Verne's From the Earth to the Moon. Though not a trained scientist, his observations and calculations pertaining to a moon trip from the Earth were amazingly prescient. He figured that the launch had to be from Florida, which it actually was a century after he wrote about it. In writing of the search for a launch site east of Tampa, Jules Verne described a jungle in which, quote, countless thousands of birds flash and glittered in plumage of the most brilliant dye. That's an exaggeration to be sure, but we can let that pass as literary license. But he went on. The most conspicuous among them was a beautiful little heron, the golden-winged firebird, as it was called by the natives. Now, here was something to pique one's interest. Just what bird was he talking about? No specific bird came to mind. I know of no golden-winged heron in Florida. So I started thumbing through some books to see if I could find such a bird under another name. There is one, the only near candidate, and it's not that near. Only one could I find. It was the uh, tropical bird, the yakana or yakanya, which has golden underwings. But it couldn't have been that. It's not common in Florida. It's not found in the forest, about which Vern was writing, and it's not a heron. So what was Jules Verne referring to? The clue comes in a preceding paragraph in which a tropical forest is described as, quote, a labyrinth of pomegranate, orange, citron, olive, apricot, and banana trees. Now, what's wrong with that picture? Well, olive and apricot and pomegranates are not native to Florida, nor bananas either, for that matter. And while some tropical trees may have been imported over the years, Mr. Verne's explorers would definitely not have encountered those plants in the middle of Florida in the middle of the 19th century. In other words, he made it all up, which should not have come as a surprise since his book is a work of fiction. The golden-winged firebird that he named, then, is an invention, not just another name for a real bird. So don't expect to see one. But do read the book. It's a good story with some touches of humor, but it's definitely short on accurate ornithology.